Good morning, everyone. I wish I have all the answers, as he has said, uh, but I, I believe that I'm a student, I'm a learner, and I continue to learn. And I come here with the hope that I will learn more, even through this presentation. Um, the topic given to me is schools equipping healthy churches that send. And i um, like to make a reflection from the Nigerian experience. The abstract, the next clip, is actually putting bullet points to the abstract given to me, describing this uh, work before I started. And that is to look at successful examples in Nigeria where they have integrated classroom and field work, uh, particularly relating to church involvement in missions. Also to address some questions which include how careful do institutions need to be regarding the missionary space. Also, as Baptists, we believe the church is the foundation and the center uh, of mission and um, how do we maintain that, and how do the seminaries play their role to support the churches to do that, and how can the schools serve, equip, and even go out without usurping the authority of the churches. The problems, the challenges. <clears throat> The first I noted is the misunderstanding of the essence of mission in most settings, uh, even in Nigeria. Uh, many see uh, missions as uh, distributing goods, meeting social needs, providing amenities, uh, rather than sharing the gospel and the message of the cross and inviting people to that decision. So that's a major challenge that theological institutions need to look into. Second, the cruciality of enlisting theological educators that can train. Um, since yesterday, we heard of uh, different presentations uh, where the, the theological educator uh, need to be someone who himself had been regenerated and has a calling. And it's very, very crucial. There are some institutions that uh, recruit um, teachers, instructors, uh, based on their degrees. And sometimes, to punish them, uh, take them away from a church and send them to the theological schools. I had one heads up, head of theological institution that says the seminary is not a dumping ground. And I believe and accept what he says. And we need to be careful who we send to be a teacher in theological institutions if we want them to be institutions that we equip churches to send. And in the third place, the seriousness in considering those who are admissible for training in theological institutions. Um, we have a structure um, that evaluates to find out if the students have known Christ, if they have been discipled, and if they have, have a sense of call to ministry. But that notwithstanding, in my experience as theological ed educator, um, for over 20 years, I have observed that there are some who come to teach, I mean, to study in the seminary, and they are not expected, or they're not supposed to be in the seminary. Uh, I've interviewed some and discovered they don't have a testimony of conversion, and they don't have a call. Someone else says, you'll be a good pastor, <laughs> and uh, they find themselves in the seminary. I had a, a sad experience once, um, interviewed someone who is very active in the church, actually one of the youth pastors in a given church, and uh, he cannot share a testimony of how he acknowledged Jesus as Lord and Savior. So my uh, interview group 
uh, refused to recommend him. And uh, uh, the report went to the senior pastor of the church, and he was concerned and was worried, and he required the institution to do something about it. And uh, a second interview was conducted. I was invited to sit and listen. And uh, at the end, it was affirmed that he cannot share a testimony of how he gave his life to Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, he was admitted. Uh, and if, if we continue to have this, then we cannot have institutions that we send. Um, I have other experiences, but I think that's a good one to share at this moment. Uh, fourth challenge that is before us is motivation and commitment to missions, not always automatic. Theological institutions usually assume that if someone has a call to ministry and he comes to be trained, the motivation that brought him to the seminary or her to the seminary is enough to keep the person going and he will end up being a missionary. Um, but that always is not the case. The next issue is the negligence of the Great Commission. Uh, we've had this morning that sometimes we are so preoccupied with the tasks before us, teaching or pastoring, and um, we give less attention to the Great Commission itself. Next, the tendency to be committed to academics rather than to missions uh, is also very high. This is more so that uh, today many governments are bringing up policies and uh, rules about accreditation, about affiliation um, that are not interested in looking at the mission and the purpose why those institutions are established. And so uh, very often we are looking at uh, the first class students uh, to be recruited as teachers and to um, look for those who perform very highly academically to come to seminary because of our accreditation needs and uh, requirements. And the last I have here is the assumption that the sense of call to mission in the student is enough to motivate them for greater commitment to missions. Uh, I've mentioned something similar to that already. Um, when students come to seminary, very often uh, they, they are influenced by others. And some who had come with the zeal to serve as missionaries end up becoming pastors of churches um, because they, they get the impression that um, the missionaries are the forgotten ones and they do not want to be forgotten. And so they change to something else. Um, uh, the certainty of um, getting your livelihood when you serve as a pastor is not the same with when you serve as a missionary. And we all know that very often missionaries are forgotten. Objectives. In light of the problem stated and the um, abstract given, I find five things I like to uh, set as objectives for this paper. First, to highlight several vital signs of an institution that is able to equip churches. Second, identify the making of a missionary. Which of our students can actually be a missionary? And what kind of student can be prepared to be a missionary? Third, name historical antecedents of the role of theological institution or theological education or theological educators in uh, preparing churches that same. And fourth, present models of integrating academic and mission commitment, particularly from the Nigerian experience. And last, define the place of theological institutions in this whole process. I have an outcome. And that is that theological institutions become more intentional in empowering churches to send by taking advantage of the existing potentials and being sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That last part there I like to stress 
um, that yes, we may have strategies, we may have approaches, we may have skills to be able to reach out, to share the gospel. Um, sometimes we have mathematical analysis of how we can do it. Um, but if it is the great commission as given by Christ, he promised his presence, and that presence is the work of the Holy Spirit. And we see that through scriptures that God always leads. One experience in the ministry of Paul in the book of Acts was his desire to go to some other region and the Holy Spirit forbade him and had to go to Troas and as he waited, he had a voice and the voice was come over to Macedonia and help. And so as we discuss these principles or practices or even approaches that we um, engage in to be able to prepare churches to send, we must be conscious that God is at work and we are simply to join him in his work. I'd like to start with vital signs for an institution that, it, that empowers sending. Number one, regenerated faculty. We have some faculty members that are not regenerated. It's unfortunate. Um, <laughs> they are either hired because they know somebody or uh, someone wants to find food for someone and gets them into the institutions. The more of this that we have in, in our institutions, we make our institutions unable to prepare churches to send. Second, instructors with a calling to teach and to engage in mission. The two side by side. Um, we must have a faculty uh, that is ready to give what it takes, not only to teach, but to actually engage in missions uh, directly. Uh, it might not be as consistent and as um, strong as someone who is in full-time missions, but we have our weekends and we have other times within um, our time, our, our, our events and activities and the institutions to be able to be involved. I heard Dr. Lawless talk about if he has authority one day, what he would love to do is to require all faculty to visit a mission field. And I think that's, that's the idea that is expressed here. In the third place, institutions that are careful, uh, that carefully consider the spiritual and academic qualification of the faculty they enlist in the institution. It's related to the first and second. In the fourth place, institutions that prioritize a sense of conversion and call to ministry for her prospective students. Uh, again, uh, one of the danger which I noted a little yesterday from one of the presentations is when, when we say, let's train everybody um, so everybody can go. Um, besides taking the place of the local church in sending, uh, we also end up training people who are not called to ministry. Uh, and... Um, Yes, in some settings, you have people who would say, I want to have theological education, I'm not called, and I don't want to be a pastor, I just want to know, I want to help myself. I think we need to evaluate how, um, how we do that, because many of them come in, they influence very many others uh, in their own way of thinking, and have a way in which it affects uh, the institution, directly or indirectly. And there are some who will say, I will not be a pastor, I will not be a missionary, but I just want to know I'm an engineer, I'm a, I'm a medical person. Uh, that's a little bit different from training vocational missionaries. And uh, I think um, the IMB had, had a model, I don't know if they still do, um, of, of a short-term training 
for vocational missionaries, whether medical or uh, whatever, that's, that's still someone that has a missionary calling and has a conversion experience and is, is going to use the skills that he or she has uh, to do missions in a mission field. I, I, I am not against that, but I, I think there's going to be a serious problem if we just say, let's train everybody. The seminary in Ogbumosho had uh, a challenge once. They've, they've had Bachelor of Theology for a long time and they had just introduced Bachelor of Missiology in the institution and um, decided that since that is a new program, they will want to uh, run that program and suspend Bachelor of Theology program. We had over 100 applications for Bachelor of Missiology, but it was one of the most difficult class to teach because um, they do not want to be missionaries. And the reason they apply for Bachelor of Missiology is because they want to go to Obomosho. They want to have a first degree. And whether you did missions or you did theology, you can be a pastor. And they want to be pastor. They don't want to be missionaries. And it, it was very hard for me to tell them that any pastor who is not a missionary is not a pastor. I was, uh, but I had to, <laughs> I had to do that, and uh, I still look back to that moment, and I see many of those who did that program that year, uh, ending up in other things, and some of their church is not interested in missions at all, and so there's there's need to be very careful um, in ensuring that we actually give attention to conversion and to call to ministry and ministry that has the Great Commission at the center. And whether one will train as a pastor, an educator, or a music minister, that his calling includes and prioritizes the Great Commission. The next, instructors see ministry as primary goal rather than the privileges they enjoy as professors. Um, in some of our institutions, uh, we might be having hirelings rather than um, appropriate theological educators. They want to get the benefits, they want to get uh, the positions, and not so much of preparing people for the gospel ministry. And if our institutions are going to be preparing um, churches to send, and we must give great attention to this. Uh, next. An institution guided by the Great Commission in its curriculum and programs, um, both curricular and non-curricular programs of the institution must push everyone to that consciousness that we have one great responsibility. And wherever they go, that they will make that a priority. And the last I have here is that there's a need for theological institutions to bring uh, the consciousness of all stakeholders, I mentioned too in this um, outline, heading here, uh, the churches and those who uh, write references for our students to know what it takes for someone to be called to ministry as they fill those forms. Uh, there are some who fill the forms for our students and they, they, they feel that I wouldn't be a hindrance to God calling somebody. And they know that that somebody does not know Jesus. He, he does not have a family that can uh, support his involvement in missions uh, or even in, in other forms of pastoral ministry um, that the seminary trains for. Identity of a prospective missionary in our students. I have four things mentioned here. First, evidence of conversion experience. I've said this before. Nurture in the church. Paul to Timothy said one thing. He said, do not assign new converts to leadership responsibilities. And one of the principles I want to believe most of our institutions consider is that the person should not be 
um, a, a new convert. But then, how new? What do we mean by new? Is um, subjective. Uh, some schools will say at least a person should have given his life to Jesus two years before seeking theological education. And some will want to say more than that. Uh, but whatever it is, there is a crucial need for someone to receive some level of training, some level of growing in the local church through the discipleship ministry of the church. And for the church to be able to discover that this person has a potential and has a calling and is committed to something in the local church. We like to always ask, what do you do in the church during the interviews? And want to hear them do something, uh, doing something in the church before we can uh, say, well, I think with the recommendations, we can consider these as, as students. They must be nurtured. Um, sometimes we don't get this right. I've had a few times when after a class session, a student will walk to my office and say, I'm not sure I have given my life to Christ. And I lead the person to give his life to Christ. Is the person supposed to still continue to train? Yes. He had come in, he had owned up, but I think it's not the best for us. It's, um, it's best that the pastors of the churches do that and help them to grow and understand the nature of the gospel ministry before they are enrolled in the institutions. And the third is evidence of a sense of call to ministry. That can sometimes be seen in their involvement in the local church, but other times they might be involved in the local church, but they haven't had that sense of call. They just are interested in doing something, and they want to just do something. And um, that's not good enough. The fourth one, actually, if the first three are there, there won't be a need to mention the fourth. But I think we still need to do that the person is teachable. And when, as a theological educator, you discover somebody is not teachable, please do something about it. Because it, it means to me that the person has not been transformed. And I, I look at um, Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 5, and I find there scripture saying that anyone who is not in Christ, who is not led by the Spirit, cannot understand, understand or appreciate or walk with the things that are in the Spirit. And the two are in conflict. And so if someone is not teachable, then there's evidence that something is wrong with the foundation of the person's faith. Historical antecedent. And I'd like to start with the experience in the life and ministry of Jesus. And this Bible text gives me what I can term as his um, summary of theological education, if I can call it that. It says, Jesus went to a mountainside, after prayer, of course, and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them to preach. When you look through the Gospels, you find Jesus holding one theme, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand and he spent his entire life teaching them. You look at the Sermon on the Mount, which could be considered a summary of his teaching to the disciples uh, about prayer, about uh, the blessings of those who are committed, uh, who love God, uh, lovers of peace, uh, who are ready to face persecution, about prayer, about forgiveness, about love of enemies, um, and so on. You find, you find him teach them, okay? Salt and light. Um, and it, it, it gave, he had one focus, and he taught that. All the miracles, all the teachings, and all the events um, were focused on that one thing. 
And so starting with that, uh, Jesus prayed, called out the 12, and had a definite task of mission. Second, he taught them to the point that they realized he is the savior of the world. If you look at John chapter 14 to 16, he says, I have presented, I've taught them, I've told them who you are, and they know who I am. Yes, they didn't understand some things at that point, and uh, he said, I've shown them the Father, and uh, one had to ask, show us the Father. He says, you have seen me, you have known me, you've not known the Father. Uh, you will realize that I'm in the Father, you are in me, I'm in you. A mystery of a relationship. They understood that through his teaching um, because he focused on helping them to understand that. Um, they chose to remain with him because they understood who he was, even when everyone else was living. He was teaching and he says, I'm the bread of life. If you do not eat me and you don't drink my blood, you have no portion in the kingdom of God. And some started leaving. And he asked to the two of are you also going to go? Say, where do we go? You have the word of life. His teaching made an impact that though they do not understand, though the message is hard and difficult, they were ready to remain. I think if theological institutions will do this, then we would be able to prepare people that will lead our churches that we send. They were timid at the beginning and afraid. Uh, they became bold and were ready to proclaim the message, even if it means losing their lives, because they understood who Christ was. And we see that in their prayer, in, we see it in Acts 24, I mean Acts chapter 4, and we see it in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. They are ready to die for Christ. Evident that they had been with Jesus, was noticed even by neighbors, um, and they lived transformed lives. The three years of training that Jesus gave them made a great impact that lasted their lifetime. The early believers followed the model of Jesus, and we find that persecution drove the church out of Jerusalem as we see in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, the churches were um, training people and sending them, and we find the model in Acts chapter 13 of the church in Antioch. And uh, they were praying, they heard the Holy Spirit, and they sent. Uh, they gave attention to the word, the ministry of the word, and to prayer, as we see in Acts chapter 6, verse 2. Churches, church leaders, were mandated to teach before appointing people to responsibilities. We see that in the life of Timothy and Paul and Titus. And Paul was involved with people who themselves went out. Timothy, Titus were part of Paul's team in sharing the gospel in various fields before they were sent to go to those places and were asked to head churches that would train people that were sent out. The primary goal of the early believers was the Great Commission, as seen in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. The Dark Ages. The rise of the monasteries provoked <coughs> by corruption of society and the church on one hand, and pietism on the other, uh, was part of what formed the foundation of the return of missions. Those monasteries became places for meditation and prayers, as well as education, and they were transformed to become institutions with time. They became spiritual springboards for missionary activities as we find Gonzalez and Walkman noted in their researches. Monks and students were the first set of missionaries, even during the Dark Ages. Yes, their mission work was violent. It, 
it's one of the darkest period of history of Christianity when missions was actually military exploit. Uh, the Crusades, I, and I want to believe we all know about them. Um, but the heart that led them to do that was because they had secluded themselves and they were praying and the Bible was absent uh, in their meditations until the Reformation came. Now, the Reformation period. Monasteries became educational institutions, as noted by Howard. The reformers were theological educators, as also noted in those works. Yes, the reformers were not missionary, and it's because they've not gone back to the Bible. Um, but they drove the church back to the Bible, and the church saw the need for missions when the church returned to the Bible. One of the things I did recently with some of my classes uh, teaching missions is to ask them to do an assignment, go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I want them to identify what the Bible say about missions in every book of the Bible. Um, it sounded a hard assignment, but those who were able to do that came out and said, I did not realize that the Bible has said so much about missions until I did that assignment. And he remained so grateful that he had to do that assignment. And so, because the Bible was not the focus uh, during this period, yes, the reformers called for it. Um, it became one of the places where uh, the church was able to recover itself when it returns to the Bible. Post-Reformation and the modern period. The Reformation period prepared grounds for the modern missions. The rise of missionary societies um, came through those educational institutions. And two of such societies um, that are noted in these works by Gonzalez and Howard, uh, the American Bible Society, founded in 1816, and the American Board of Commissioners or foreign missions in 1810. Students were involved during the Reformation, pre-Reformation, Reformation, and post-Reformation period uh, in missions, as well as the monks in those, uh, in those monasteries. And the reawakening, which is uh, the renewal of knowledge and explosion of knowledge that came also uh, added to that restoration. And for me, those serve as antecedents to um, the relationship between theological institution or education generally to the rise of missions. And during the colonial period, looking at Africa, we, we note and we know all that uh, education and missions came together. Uh, one of the great benefits that the continent enjoys today is um, the institutions started by missionaries. All our theological institutions, for instance, were started by missionaries. And looking at the Nigerian experience, um, I just mentioned two institutions here. The Nigerian Baptist Theological Seminary Ubumosho, established in 1898. Uh, it's the oldest tertiary institution in the continent. Uh, it offered bachelor's programs before the establishment of the first university in Nigeria. Uh, and, and so, um, and that's all the dividend of uh, the missionary work in our continent. And the Baptist Theological Seminary in Kaduna in 1948, and Nigeria got her independence in 1960. 
And so um, a lot of the legacies that came, that gave us this privilege for theological education, as well as for missions, um, all came together through missionary effort. Empowering churches for mission. And this were um, some examples will be noted of our experience in Nigeria. And I like us to take note of this and reflect the opportunities that we have in our own settings um, for other ways uh, to help our students become more missionary. First, the theological educator models and leads to missionary engagement. A number of our faculty members uh, have been engaged in field visitations, and we go with students. Um, different ways we have done that. Uh, one of the ways is by taking a few people and go to a field and plant churches. Um, one of such churches uh, was planted in Nubumosho, um, through the church, of course, uh, calling attention to the pastor of the church. I am involved in missions, and the church should take responsibility to be aware about this. And um, later on, the church was handed over to the church, um, to, the, to the church where the faculty members were members. Um, so there's a need to lead out in missions. And we have others who would visit mission fields with student groups uh, annually during the uh, small breaks that we have in the session. Second, conscious integration of missionary engagement through the implementation of academic curriculum, uh, evangelism and church planting classes especially. And for this, I've seen also a number of uh, teachers who would require students to plant a church during the church planting class, uh, or to go for evangelism and write verbatim reports uh, to be submitted and studied in the class setting. And I found them very productive. Uh, in, in my teaching, I've, I've found churches that are planted this way, uh, we partner with churches and request them to support us for transportation. And then um, in the end, uh, we find a church that is willing to adopt uh, that church. The, one of the great advantages theological institutions have is manpower. And uh, make that available to the churches. Um, I, I've, I've been raising this consciousness with a number of churches in the uh, Kaduna area but they haven't taken advantage of it as much yet, uh, where they could just notify the seminary if they have a place they want to evangelize, just bring six, seven, ten students to get involved in evangelism with us, and we take responsibility, and afterwards they return and we continue with the work in the, in the field. So there's a need for us to get involved in that, using the curriculum to uh, in addition to some of what we've heard this morning. The third place, creating missionary engagement through various forms of partnerships. In Kaduna, uh, currently we have partnership with a local church uh, that is funding a mission summit annually. Um, and we've had the third one this year, uh, discussing various um, approaches we can get involved in missions and inviting uh, stakeholders uh, from our churches. We invite mission directors at conference association levels. We invite um, mission directors in churches and those who are leading the Men Missionary Union, Women Missionary Union, uh, to come for a two-day summit to deal with uh, a particular approach of uh, reaching out to Muslims, being in a Muslim community. And having this kind of opportunities will be very helpful in raising the consciousness of the churches to send. In the fourth place, the creation of mission manuals and training material. 
One of the material we used in our first mission summit uh, was prepared um, by the seminary. And uh, we have uh, 12 lessons uh, uh, on a topic, growing as a witness, uh, which we also used in the institution, uh, having a mission hour every week uh, to study that material and encourage students to pair up uh, for evangelism within the week and provide report. Um, we're making some progress. We wish that we make more, uh, but this, these are avenues through which we can um, help prepare them and raise their consciousness. First, to be witnesses themselves um, and realize that the, the people who are yet to know Christ are bad people unlovable people, and they need to be loved uh, in spite of that. That growing from the experience in Nigeria that's making many to be paranoid about reaching the Muslims because of the violence, because of the terrorism uh, being faced, members of their families being killed, and so many are not interested in reaching out to Muslims. But there's a need to know that anyone who is lost is a bad person. And that bad person can be a good person. And it depends on what we do uh, in our relationship with such a person. In the first place, they need to create, uh, okay, I've mentioned that mission manuals. Uh, fifth, develop long vacation missionary engagement uh, in form of short-term missions for our students, okay? And then uh, create non-curricular programs um, that can invite others to join, like the one I just shared about. In the seventh place, the seminary uh, assigns students weekend ministries uh, and supervise uh, their work jointly, a faculty member and the pastor of the church where they serve for a period of time. Eighth, theological institutions need to give priority attention to the process of recruiting and enlisting students as well as faculty. I've mentioned that earlier, but that's to describe the student who is expected to be a student, I mean, a missionary and an institution. But here, I'm dis describing this here as a task that the seminary should take seriously if it's going to prepare people for ministry. Uh, the place of the church. I like to note that first and foremost, the church, sorry, uh, the Theological institution. Uh, a theological institution is first and foremost a coach or a midwife and expected to uh, coach um, the students as well as coach the church um, where possible to help them understand um, their task, uh, help mobilize and all that. Also prepare stakeholders for missions, um, like the mission summit I talked about, inviting people to come and learn and share experiences. And sometimes we invite even missionaries in the field to take part of the teachings um, that we hold in those sessions. And then provide support to churches by providing people who can get involved in evangelism with them and um, help them to set a tone for ministry. Identity of potential, sorry, identify potentials. It's more like question or things of reflection that I want us to um, consider at the end. Um, what do you consider as challenges hindering your institution from midwifing for missions? Uh, and then identify potentials for empowering the churches in your context. i like us to think about these two. Uh, next, that's in the next clip. I want us to think about this and work on it, reflect on it. Uh, conclusion. Theological institutions are expected to be coaches and midwives. Two. Theological institutions need to nurture the missionary zeal of the students. Three, 
those exposed to missions while in training become more missionary when they get to the field. My experience has shown that those who visited home mission fields while in school would be missionary even if they are pastors and would be willing to send. Uh, but those who never had any experience with a mission field do not think about it and may never encourage their churches to send. And so whatever we can do to encourage students to have a field experience or practical experience, visit one mission field, um, is going to be very helpful. And then empower churches, um, whatever. If they need teaching, they can invite us to come teach in the church. I've had some churches do that. I've had some associations do that. Um, one association in Lagos invited me to help them. They were reflecting on an association is expected to be a mission sending agency. And how do we think about that? So they said, ask for someone from the seminary to come and teach them about that. And let's take advantage of those opportunities empowering them. I found missions, that missions is church-based. Um, it is not seminary-based. If seminary plan churches, a seminary should be willing to give them up and face its work. Um, Sometimes seminary, uh, churches are planted by seminary. They want to remain as babies to seminary. Uh, but I think from the beginning, the seminary should carry along a church uh, when they want to plant a church as a demonstration for that church to see the need to keep planting and evangelizing. Theological institutions and churches need to synergize in doing missions. Thank you.